Welcome back to uh, Woke Nation, uh, the 24th of February. This particular episode, I, I spoke, uh, I guess, an episode or two ago about kind of the direction I wanted to be heading with this podcast, which was more into, um, you know, satire and making it the podcast a little more entertaining. But I also said that I wanted to kind of do something on literature because I, I love to read and I think that's a kind of a forgotten, in a sense, a forgotten topic um, today. You know, we we live in a time where the the newest electronic gadget is is reign supreme in the end, as far as our entertainment and as far as how we digest news, uh, how we receive our news. And most people get their news through Twitter, or Facebook, and you get that through an iPad or excuse me, on your iPhone, or, you know, people don't even have laptops uh, the as much anymore. Some people do. I'm recording on a laptop right now, but on the whole, uh, electronic devices are getting smaller and smaller and more compact, and what you can do on these tiny devices is, is, a, is dramatically increasing. Um, now, uh, I, even the tower computers are basically gone, but... That being said, the uh, it, it is a shame. I think I think it is a tragic shame that uh, that a lot of um, a lot of th you see a lot of thought and the ability to think coherently and to and to use logic and reason uh, is starting to go out the window as technology increases. Uh, and they and they've done plenty of studies that that show the ill effects that that things like a Kindle or a Nook or an iPad. And all these video games have on developing minds. Now, I, you know, and, and people say, well, less and less people are reading books today, and they point to technology as one of the main causes for this decline in in literacy. I, I don't know so much about that. I I know it it definitely hampers it and has an effect on it. But when people say less and less people are reading today than they were in the past, well, what past are you talking about? You know. A lot of people will point back to to a couple hundred years ago, like like during Victorian era England, where Charles Dickens reigned supreme and was the modern celebrity, or Lord Byron, the poet, you know, who was the first modern celebrity. They called it Byron mania. I think he wrote the great epic poem Don Juan, and women swooned and men swooned over him. They used to mail him letters with locks of their. Uh, certain types of hair in it and he had affairs with everybody you know the the victorian era press was obsessed with him and his latest scandals of who he was sleeping with and it it, it mirrors it, it was a mirror reflection of how our paparazzi and our uh tmz and and all that uh is run but anyway back in that time period you know it, there is this idea that that everybody read and because there was no TV. So what else would they do? Well, that's not true. Now, it's true that that um, you had either the the playhouse or, or the theater or, or books. Now, just because you only had those choices doesn't mean everybody could read. In fact, I, I, I this isn't something I have studied, but when I hear people say that less people are reading today than before, Again, I would say, then, what before are you talking about? Even at time periods where, like, when there was new TV or no movies or no video games or no iPads, did it, what was the rate of literacy at that time would be my question. I don't think it was any greater then. In fact, I think today we have a greater late rate of literacy now than we ever have. Um, now, so I, I don't know. I think I think it's always been the case that more intelligent people generally read for for entertainment and, and enjoy reading and those who aren't really intellectual are going to find another find other avenues to entertain themselves or to learn um that are less stimulating and and use your brain less um i i think it's always been the, that case um just because there wasn't tv doesn't mean that people didn't um, find other ways to entertain themselves, like like the theater, or just as an example, if you want to go back to Victorian era England, I I just don't I don't buy that. Now that isn't to say that that I don't think that's not to say that that all this technology isn't having some kind of negative effect on 
on the the rate of reading in the country and people that read for pleasure. Um, but I also think the the uh, the book industry is is uh, largely to blame for that too. Um, because the industry today, if you look at the major publishers like Harper Collins, um, Random House, I, I don't even know what the major, because they've all literally, to a large extent, like any other industry, uh, bought each other up. So now there are only a couple large ones that kind of publish everything. And they have these little sub branches, sub publishers underneath them that are still in existence. And you'll see their name on the side um on the spine of a book, but they're really owned by Random House or Doubleday. You know, I don't even know if Doubleday is around anymore. There's Penguin Classics, but who are they owned by? Um, but anyway, most of these publishers have been bought up by the bigger houses, and these bigger houses are interested in one, just like anything else now, are interested in one thing only, and that's money. And so what they what what you see when you walk into your average bookstore is shelf upon shelf upon shelf of what you call pop fiction and that's that's fiction that really i mean it's it, it's a, a crass well not crass but like a cheap a, a way to describe like summer reading you know you would read these books on the beach it, they're books that are not stimulating the the style of writing is very easy to follow um it, it's not it's there's no, you can't distinguish the style of one writer's prose from another. There's no distinguishing characteristics of the, between the writing of Stephen King, Michael Creighton, Tom Clancy, or John Grissom, or Tammy Hogue, or Mary Higgins Clark, or any of them. I know a lot of them. I've read them. I've read John Grissom. I've read Tom Clancy. I've read Stephen King. There's no difference as far as their prose or their writing style. Um, it, it's very cardboard. There's There's no real talent to it uh well I, sh I shouldn't say that they are great storytellers i admit that but as far as the actual writing goes you know the the focus is on storytelling and and on and uh, on keeping the story moving at a fast clip to keep the reader engaged because we also have these very short intention spans today so developing plot um, developing characters and all that has kind of, in a lot of ways, gone out the window, you know, in the, in the, um, uh, and that's sacrificed for fast moving, exciting stories with lots of violence, sex, and profanity. I mean, that's just the truth. If you look at the New York Times bestseller list, the, this is what sells these, these pop novels, um, and and the actual art of literature has gone out the window to a large extent. Even our literary authors, um, great, you know, you know, like I'm saying, you have pop fiction, which is most of what you see, and probably the bulk of what sells, besides cookbooks and self-help books. But if you look at actual literature, what people would call literary writers, like Michael Chabon, um, Zadie, I think it's Zadie Smith. Uh, Junot, Junot Diaz, um, those are the top three I can think of off the top of my head. Um, Toni Morrison, I, I guess, um, there, and there's others, but those are just the top three I can think of. Um, and they, you know, Michael Chabon is, is a very good writer, um, in a lot of ways. And if you want to read a really, really good book and it, it won the Pulitzer Prize, it's his, I think it was, no, it wasn't his first novel, but it was, it's The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Very good book. It won the Pulitzer Prize, like I said. Um, so I'm not discounting um, him as a writer in any way. It, I, it, it has to do with two cousins during the, um, during World War II who uh, immigrate to America from Europe, and I think they're Jewish, and they, um, they're very passionately, uh, they're big fans of comic books. And so they start writing these uh, comic books that kind of reflect their struggles and, and kind of reflect the the world around them with World War II and, and the Holocaust and stuff like that. Um, but it has, you know, besides that, it, it's it's a very large epic book that has, it goes very deep into their lives, these tangled relationships. And it, and it paints a very vivid picture of that kind of that time period in America. It's a fascinating book, and it won the Pulitzer Prize, like I said, and I think it was a big bestseller as well. 
Um, so I'm not, I'm not discounting that, but then the prose itself, you know, when I talk about literature, when I talk about great writers, what I think of is not only the ability to tell a story well, but also to write well. And, and, and in writing well, there is a difference between how you write and how the guy next to you writes. You have your own distinguishing prose, your own style of telling the story. And I think that too has, has in large part gone out the window because even our literary writers today um, just aren't doing that. Like Michael Chabon, he, he has, he's talented. He can write well and, and his prose such as it is, is far superior to Stephen King or any of these pop writers who, like I said before, are very flat, very boring. Um, it's a lot of she said, he said, and very little description or, or character development. Michael Chabon can do that. Zadie Smith can do that in her books, like White Teeth, I think, which was one of the most um, um one of the most um, rewarded or, or decorated would be the right word uh, debut albums of the 2000s. I think it was yeah, it was White Teeth. I read it. Zadie Smith. It was a good book, and it was about Indian immigrants living in Britain and kind of how their culture uh, is meshing with British culture, the life of the immigrant in Britain, basically. And it's a very funny book. It's a great book in a lot of ways. But again, there's no distinguishing characteristic to her prose. Um, you have to go back kind of a couple decades in, in American and world uh, history, uh, European uh, writing to really get to a time when that was still important, where prose and, and, the, and writing, the, your own style of prose was also very important. And it was something uh, it was like your signature, you know, as a writer. And you have to go back probably to the 70s to where uh, 80s to where we last really saw. Although, before I get to the end of this, there are two writers right now that, uh, and it actually a, um, a publishing press called Sagging Meniscus, uh, which if you want writers that are, are uh, defiantly um, unique, and and not only with their the stories they choose to tell, but how they choose to tell them, um, the different formats of storytelling that they play around with, um, metafiction, everything, but also their prose is totally unique to them individually. Nobody else writes like like, like them, and they, and that's a big part of who they are as writers. Um, I want to get to that before the end here. Um, but yeah, you ha you have to go back. Um, generally, besides the writers at Sagging Meniscus, which I'll go into in a minute, you have to go back to the 70s or something like that. You have to go back to the postmodern era of writing, um, where you have like John Barth, um, uh, Thomas Pynchon, which I'm reading his. I've read his first book, V, which was pretty. It was decent. I I wasn't like head over heels about it or anything. But it was a pretty good book. But right now I'm reading his what he, the book he's most famous for, which is Gravity's Rainbow, which is just a mind. It, it's a it's it's been called a cartoon inferno, a comic extravaganza. Just a, it, it's the there are books, there are study guides, there are guidebooks written to help walk you through this book. It's over 700 pages long. I mean, it's won countless awards. It's it's an undisputed classic of uh, late 20th century writing. And um, I think it came out in 1973. And Pynchon, I mean, the guy is incredibly, obviously well-educated. He, uh, and like I said, they, I mean, it has to, it's a story written about World War II and um, kind of, it's, it's a comedy and a drama, and a, it's a dramedy in a lot of ways, a comedy and a drama story about a guy who was, uh, <laughs> he had experiments performed on him when he was a child, uh, so that anytime he, uh, makes love, basically, um, it, it sends out, a signal is sent out so that, uh, pinpointing his location and then the Germans then are able to launch their rockets on that location. So this guy's, you know, he's, he's in love with this woman, 
and I think they get married or whatever, but any time they perform the act of love, uh, rockets rain down on that area um, the next day. Um, fortunately for them, they're kind of nomadic, so they don't die from this, but they keep moving around. And the American art or the British army starts to realize that uh, a map that he keeps with him, um, pinpoint, uh, kind of detailing the locations that they've slept, him and his wife, and stayed at these bed and breakfasts and these houses. And he's a soldier at the same time, but I, she's with him somehow. I've, it, it's a why. It, um, and they and then they so they start to realize there's something going on with him, and he goes on the run with her but there's i mean there's probably 50 characters to this book each with their own subplot and it's written in a in a in a very hallucinatory style of writing so it's it's you have to reread certain passages to even really grasp what's going on um and, and he pinchin goes between reality and fantasy with with no warning whatsoever i mean in one in one um section you'll be reading about it like a battle, an army battle, and the next, uh, an octopus is coming out of the ocean and grabbing this guy. His name's Tyrone Slothrop, <laughs> and is that, that's the other thing. His characters have these ridiculous names, like Benny Bloat, Tyrone Slothrop, uh, George Profane, like all these wild names. But an octopus will come out of the ocean and grab his wife, you know. And it, and the uh, the octopus is some Greek uh, thing. Uh, everything in the book is based off of history, science, mythology, religion. Uh, that's why there's study guides to go along with it. But anyway, um, so I mean, you got to, there's, you know, Thomas Pynchon, my favorite writer from the postmodernist era, and probably one of my favorite writers of all time is Robert Coover. Uh, I've talked about it before, his book, The Public Burning, which is on Nixon and the Rosenbergs, who were a married uh, husband and wife who were captured during the McCarthyan area era um, in communism in the 1950s, and they were found to be communist spies, and they were executed. Well, the book The Public Burning has to do with that. Nixon's this outrageous, uh, decrepit character in it, um, but uh, Uncle Sam's a – it's a comedy slash – it's a dramedy, just kind of like Gravity's Rainbow, um, except it, it's, it's a very – sharp satire too of, of the um the the how our government's just become a corrupt machine and uh uncle sam is a literal character in it and he he saw uh, there is some disgusting stuff in the book in a, in a certain way i mean he sodomizes nixon at the end and that's that's where nixon starts to run for president you kind of get the analogy there um but it, it's it's a very sharp brilliant very you know and he has a very distinct writing style too coover um so i mean i think a lot of that's missing um part of the reason too why i've i wanted to put this out is because of um the latest uh, news coming out of what's going on and you know i'm going to jump over to politics briefly here uh, with roger stone um you know this is one re i i always see literature as this very you know, as a as a powerful weapon in a lot of ways, politically speaking, um, author, authoritarian governments always shut down the written word first. They the pen is mightier than the sword. You know, it, it's 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 been proven demonstrably throughout history that the written word um, can topple governments, can topple empires, can topple kings, and so they always shut down uh, speech that that would uh, stand against them that would be defiant, that would challenge them, that would criticize them, and that would mock them. There is nothing author authoritarian, totalitarian. Uh, monarchs hate more than being mocked. And that is why if you look down through history, the history of literature, some of the most important works and the most important writers were satirists, which I love. Um, if you, looking way back, um, and again, I, I mentioned this, like I said, because of Roger Stone um, recently, just recently in his case, you, if you remember, he was arrested um, by, uh, it must have been 500 FBI agents who drove a tank up onto his front lawn and blew down his front door, 
um, his dogs and cats and his maid came running out screaming. There was a turret gun on his front lawn and they were mowed down in cold blood. Um, his wife tried to, you know, surrender and I think somebody shot her. And finally, Roger Stone himself came outside in his pajamas rubbing his eyes and they mercifully cuffed him. And, you know, thank God for that. Um, I, for the past, since he's been allowed, since he has been free, I haven't allowed my three, three-year-old son out of the house. I mean, and I live in Pennsylvania. I can't imagine how people in Florida are dealing with the terror of knowing that this 66-year-old man is not in prison. Uh, I mean, shoo, you, they, they must be in a constant state of panic. They must have like the siren, like bombing raids. Every time Roger Stone leaves his house, woo! and everyone goes to the bomb shelters and you know hides their kids and you know you're waiting by the front door white knuckles on a shotgun you know because this 66 it's utterly ridiculous utterly ridiculous and Mueller when the history books are written on all this Robert Mueller will be looked on as as just an outrageous a figure of outrageous abuse in the, uh, of our constitution of this whole period, the attempted coup on Trump that he was part of, this idiot McCabe that's out in the press now, literally on 60, 60 Minutes admitting that that he was part of an attempted coup. That's how stupid these people are, that, that when they get out and, and, and get in interviews, they admit it. McCabe admits it. Comey has admitted it. How many times did Comey... I mean, if if the roles were reversed... On all this, and, and and somebody like McComey was, you know, one of was a was a conservative, a genuine conservative, and he was being grilled in front of Democrats. Do you think they would have allowed him to get away with saying I don't know, or I don't remember, or I don't recall, or I just don't know, maybe two hundred times during his hearing, and yet he got away with it when we when when the Republicans questioned him. You know, the just the brazen ballsiness of, of this these people that are so outrageously corrupt, yet incredibly stupid at the same time, like McCabe or Cohen or any of them. Just these people that are coming out are just idiots. But anyway, um, Roger Stone, I, I keep rambling here. I, I don't know. Hopefully this isn't a disaster of an episode. But, uh, you know, I wanted to – it's important – um, your freedom of speech and, and writing plays a big part of that. We're going to see, we're going to see uh, what you're allowed to write about, what you're allowed to laugh at, what you're allowed to mock. You're, you're seeing that starting to be challenged. And with Roger Stone, um, he, he, he placed some picture on Instagram with, with the judge, which her name, let me look, I have all this written out. Let me see here. If I even, uh, crap. Let me see. Hold on one second if I can find it. Roger Stone gag order right here. I wrote something up on this. Um, what's her name? Judge Amy Berman Jackson. Um, he put some picture of her up on Instagram with a law, with a criticism of her and basically a typical Roger Stone rant against the abuses of the Mueller investigation. And and she thought there was a crosshairs or something behind her face in the picture. It was really the a watermark. It was a logo of whoever posted, did the original picture. Roger Stone didn't create the picture, whatever it was. I didn't see it. But the point being, she hauls him in, into court because of this picture, and place it and choose him out and places a gag order on him so now he can no longer defend and talk about the case at all he cannot talk about the charges being brought against him he cannot defend himself in the court of public opinion um he can't defend himself you know, in the court of public he's he, he can't address his supporters about it he can't do anything he can't talk about the case at all that is so incredibly anti-American. I I know over in Europe they do that, but I to my knowledge we don't do that here at all and for good reason because your your ability to defend yourself um verbally and to it, not only in, in court but also in the court of public opinion 
uh, in writing um, to your followers and your supporters to update people on what's going on in your trial, um, to to be able to say whether something is true or not when when rumors and et cetera start coming out in in our deranged circus of a media. Um, to, to put a gag on that, to, to tell somebody they can't talk at all is, I don't know how she got away with that. And that is like a slap in the face to everything our country stands for. Um, and that's kind of why I'm talking about this. I wanted to do an episode on literature anyway. Um, but you know, it, it just, you know, what I read that it just, Ed Roger Stone, don't get me wrong. He does stupid things from time to time. I happen to like Roger Stone. I, I read his book, Stone's Rules. It was funny. Um, it's not some great masterpiece, but I like flamboyant, uh, colorful characters that are controversial and stir the pot. And Roger Stone does that. So I like Roger Stone. But, you know, the picture itself was stupid. Was this the time to post something like that? Probably not. But you know what? That... That, that doesn't make it illegal, and that doesn't mean you take away his right to talk. Now, she did say, you're allowed to, uh, you're allowed to still ask your supporters for monetary support, because everybody knows that his finances have been totally drained by this, uh, by, by paying his lawyers, by the court costs, by his, uh, he has to hire armed guards because of the amount of death threats he's getting. The man is broke, totally broke, and he admits it. So she said, oh, you can you can still ask your supporters for money, Roger. But guess what? If by placing a gag order on him, that severely limits your ability to ask for support. Suppose further accusations come out against him um, that would sway whether people would support him or not. And suppose they're not true. He can't address that at all. He can't defend himself at all. He can't defend himself to his own supporters at all. And so if lies come out about him and his supporters believe those lies and choose not to to uh, donate to him, there's no way he can combat that whatsoever. I mean, that is just so wrong on so many levels. It is, like I said, anti-American. It is a total rape of his First Amendment rights um, right off the bat. Um, it's And it's cruelly indicative of the fascist Mueller probe, a probe that has taken a king-size dump on our Constitution, trampled over attorney-client privilege, spied without legitimate authorization on American citizens, including the President of the United States when he was a candidate and now current president, um, entrapped, decorated veterans, and has created nothing but process crimes and wasted millions and millions of taxpayer dollars. Um, it's just, this thing has been a monumental, total waste of money, and it, and it's, honestly, it's, the one good thing it's done is it's shown, you want to talk about the written word it's shown how the mainstream press the mainstream written word investigative journalism in america has been totally destroyed um and it, and is sucking at the teat of the democrat party it is arm in arm linked with them in in an ideological war against the conservative right and christian america there's no deny, denying that when you see stories like the, the BuzzFeed story, which is totally untrue. Uh, CNN just happened to be there during Roger Stone's arrest. These are mainstream liberal uh, news outlets that are working in tandem with the Democrat Party. They're the propaganda arm of the Democrat Party. Um, and, and that's another, you know, if you want to talk more about how the written word is so important, there it is right there. You know, uh, the the power of the written word to 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 form narrative um, and it's being used by the Democrat Party to set the narrative uh, as far as Russia and Trump and people like Roger Stone, Jerome Corsi and others. Um so it's it's very bad what's going on, and it's very important that that people know what is is happening, and people have to be outraged, and they have, you have to respond to it, you have to criticize it by using your words and your freedom of speech, and you have to write about it. 
writing is is far more valuable and important than making a documentary or making making a, a film or something like that. I don't care what anyone says. At the end of the day, it is. There are things you can do with words that you can do in writing that you can never do with film. Okay. Um, just in, as an example, Tolkien with The Lord of the Rings. Uh, when Peter Jackson went and made those movies, I would say he did as best as any he did the best anyone could possibly do with trans translating those books into film, and yet he did not even scratch the surface of those books. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, which is a book I read when I was twelve years old, I've read it twice now, um, but you could never bring that that book to film, really, legitimately. I know they did. They've done it. There's a couple film versions out there. The best one being with Gregory Peck, but you can, that book is so complex and so full of different themes. Um, Herman Melville was a, was a genius as a, as far as a writer goes, and he used every style available to him during the writing of that book. Um, there's it's written as there are sections of it that are written as a play, like a soliloquy, also. Um, I mean, he's uh, the poetry of his writing is just breathtaking. Um, and then the the deep layers of imagery and meaning, um, religious and, and otherwise, that that flow like a current through that story. Uh, there, there's no way you can put that in film. Image cannot cannot um, compete with that, with the, with the language and the, the depth of his vision. <sighs> Uh, I, that's ironic. I would say that, but it can't compete. It just can't, you know. And and the greatest writers will always outlive, um, and always have more of an impact than than any film will. Um, and, and you can just go back in history to see how uh, see the writers that have really challenged authority and will always be remembered for it. Um, it, it, just as an example, in the 1600s in England during the Restoration period, there was John Willimon, who was the second Earl of Roch Rochester. Not a whole lot is known about him as a person, except that he was a very wild individual and died very young from nu numerous uh, sexual uh, STDs, sexually transmitted disease. He was very promiscuous. He was an alcoholic, yada, yada, yada. Um, what writer back then wasn't? They were the rock stars of their age. I don't, I don't support or, or, or say, you know, I would never encourage living sinfully like that. And he, he basically got his just desserts. I think he was 33 when he died. But the man was a brilliant writer. His most famous poem was a satire against mankind. Um, he was. N he was always being banned and exiled and kicked out of England for writing plays and poems which criticized the king and his uh, debauchery and his, his, his just utter waste of taxpayer money, his, um, his bloated um, party scene that he had going inside his court. And John Wilmot was very critical of it and openly mocked the king many, many times. He did a play called where the king, I think, was called Senor Dildo or something like that. I, you know, don't, I'm not saying these are good things. I'm just saying that these things have an impact. You know, writing always has an impact. And, and the king, you know, immediately, of course, moved to exile him numerous on numerous occasions um you can look at jonathan swift one of the most fo famous satirist satire writers ever um gulliver's travels is considered one of the the if not the greatest satire ever written um it's not just a story about a giant man that goes to an island of lilliputians these tiny little people the actual what he's mocking is the the way the it's the relationship i think and i don't remember the exact it's been a while since i've read up on it and i, I read the book i believe i did i've read so many books but i read it years and years and years ago um i just bought it recently again and i'm gonna i'm gonna read it again here when i have some time but uh, it was to mock the relationship between like um uh, britain england and france and just to belittle the way these kings think of themselves and their courts and their, their, um, the, 
the overblown way, the way they over magnify uh, issues between the two countries. Um, but he also wrote a modest proposal, you know, once once Ireland, um, I guess Irish immigrants were coming into uh, England and there was an, a lot of controversy as to what to do with the, the influx of Irish children and Jonathan Swift proposed to eat them, you know, and that was his, it was a modest proposal. Um, and it caused huge outrage and controversy, but it was it, it was necessary. It really shocked people into, you know, what are we really, you know, what are our values here? What are our morals? Uh, wh where do we really stand on this? And are we compromising what we believe just because things are getting difficult? Um, so, and, and that's often pointed, the, Gulliver's Travels is considered the greatest satire ever written. And a modest proposal, as far as like an essay or a, 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 I don't know, a pamphlet or whatever you want to call it, is is always look. Jonathan Swift is considered the greatest satire writer of all time. That end of story. Uh, he is. He he's he set the bar so high, nobody's going to jump over it. Um, there's Candide by Voltaire, uh, which is one of my favorites. Um, if you go to the 20th century, there's the public burning, as I talked about before, Robert Coover. Everybody sort of catch 22 by Joseph Heller, which is probably the funniest book I've ever read in my entire life. But it absolutely devastates the um, the just the military mindset, the idea that young men should go and die in wars, fighting people they've never met and who are who really just want to live simple lives you know they it's it's just about the sheer absurdity of dying for something that you don't even really know anything about um and it just mocks the the military openly throughout the whole thing the just the insanity of war in the military a great great book of course everybody sort of every and catch 22 has gone into our english lexicon as a, as a phrase of you know anyone that's in a tight impossible spot says yeah it was a catch 22 well um then there's slaughterhouse five kurt vonnegut another great one um if if you want to look at a, a book that had a huge impact as far as um where we it was ahead of its time in a lot of ways it was the satanic verses by salman rushdie and i say it's ahead of its times because it it, it it there's parts of the book that satirize or make fun of islam and rushdie use i guess he was he was raised in in islam and later became apostate from their point of view and there was a fatwa by the Alatoy Hamein or or whatever from Iran, I guess the president of Iran, Alatoy Hamein. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but he put a fatwa down on on Rushdie's head, uh, which basically says, you know, anyone who comes across him should kill him. And uh, for years, and the the book came out in the late 80s. I, I don't even think it was in the 90s when it was in like 1988 or 1989 when the book came out. And Rushdie went into hiding for like 10 years, I think, if I remember right. I've read the book, and it, you have to really know about Islam to understand where he's mocking it. Um, I, the character of Muhammad is in there, I, if I remember right. Uh, and instead of being named Muhammad, they call him Mahound, M-A-H-O-U-N-D, which I believe, if I remember rightly, now I, I read the book maybe 10 years ago, but... I think that is the the name Mahoon means dirt or crap or something like that. Um, so you could see why they would be angry. And there was there's other things in there that kind of mock him and his his many wives and you know he's he's just a loser in in the book if I remember right. And then the idea of the satanic verses themselves is that Satan took a somehow. Um, when Muhammad was, um, when the Quran was being dictated to Muhammad, uh, he fell asleep at one point and Satan took his pen, his quill pen and copied in the satanic verse. He copied in some verses, which were not from, Muhammad, not from Allah, um, but were from Satan, um, trying to disrupt, you know, divine, uh, revelation, obviously. Um, so that's where he gets the title, the satanic verses, um, but yeah, I mean, it has a, and now we see 
a much more modern take on on kind of what happened with Rushdie with uh, uh, Charlie Hebdo, the the uh, satiric um, cartoon magazine over in France. They were all shot for making fun of Muhammad, uh, for drawing, daring to draw his face. They all got shot. And uh, of course, there was the Danish uh, cartoons crisis where they drew Muhammad's face, bomb threats, riots, uh, burnings. Uh, all across Europe because of that. And, uh, you know, so what happened with Rushdie was kind of a precursor to all that. And yet again, literature, the power of the written word. Um, if you want to look to Russia, there would be um, great... Oh, I've got to adjust how I'm sitting here. The great Russian writer Mikhail Bulgakov. Um, he wrote a book called The Master of Margarita, which um, he wrote during the um, the 1930s, which I think were called the, the Dark Purge or the Great Purge of the Stalin regime um, prior to World War II. And he this book has um, basically the devil and a cohort of um, other um, fallen angels in different forms, like one of them is a cat named Behemoth. Um, there's a couple other characters that, but the devil and his crew come up from hell and into Moscow and all madness breaks out. But what happens is, is through the story and everything, the, um, Soviet idea of, of, uh, society and, and how the Soviet man is superior to all other people, which is, you know, how any, a lot of those communist fascist socialist uh, governments always tried to put themselves at that their nationality is the superior race or whatever. Um, but the book, uh, The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, just in a, in a very devastating way mocks all that. You don't have to read it. But the book was not published until at, well after Bulgakov died. He died in, in the early days of World War II after Germany had invaded Russia. He died in, I think, 1940, in, in the spring of 1940. Um, probably not too happy because his book was unpublished, what he, the book he considered his masterpiece. And at that point, it looked like Germany might win the war because their initial push into Russia was very successful. Um, so things were looking grim when he passed. Um, of course, Germany was defeated. And eventually Stalin died. And so during the 1960s, there was a brief, I guess, window of freedom. Um, and it was during that time period that the Master of Margarita was published in a, in a Moscow literary magazine. And it, it became a phenomenon in Russia. Um, certain phrases from the book, like manuscripts don't burn, uh, became um, cultural uh, catchphrases, kind of like catch 22 is for us. Um, yeah, the phrase manuscripts don't burn, which was spoken by the devil to, um, a character in the book who tried to burn, um, something he had written and it, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't go away, which, um, harkened back to, uh, real life when Bulgakov, um, I think more than once he had burned his manuscript for the master of Margarita for fear that the Soviet police would find it. So he, he burned it more than once, I think. And he, he would always come back to it and rewrite it. Um, but like the devil said in the book, you know, manuscripts don't burn. So, um, yeah, these, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's very important that literature stay alive. Um, and so at the end of this, I want to just kind of, to anyone who loves to read, there is a publishing company, um, and I'm not sure where they publish out of, whether it's Britain or here, but they're called Sagging Meniscus Press. And it's kind of a silly name. Um, and they publish a lot of like comical books, but there's two writers that are published under their umbrella, under that public, under that, um, all, the, all their books are published by them. Um, MJ Nichols and Stephen Moles. Um, and these guys are just beyond brilliant. And th they're picking up at a point, you know, they, at, a, at a time where it's really needed in writing. Because as I said before, you know, even with the literary writers today, 
they may be good, they may be talented, and they're they may have their their good points, but again, prose has been neglected in, in the sense of of keeping it fresh. Of if something's not evolving, if something's not growing, then it's dying. And recently, it's been dying. Literature has been dying because there hasn't been a progression. There hasn't been a continuously a continuous growth. There hasn't been innovation in prose, in writing, in style. New styles haven't been coming out. You know, some people are breaking new ground in territory and mapping out new territory. Now there are some. Every once in a while, you'll see it like Ta Ta T A O Lin Tao Tao Lin. I can never say his name. Tao Lin. He's a Chinese writer out of Brooklyn. He can. He's very different. We'll say that. And he has his own unique style. Chuck Palahniuk. For a while there was a little different. Now he's gone all commercial and blech. You know, whatever. He wrote Fight Club and then fell off the map um, and then just sold his soul. But, you know, on the most part, for the most part, prose has been ignored. So these guys, MJ Nichols, just totally unique. Um, if you get a chance, read his book, A Postmodern Belch. The thing is hilarious. It, it's metafiction, and metafiction is kind of like where you're writing a story about a story within a story. Um, and so the the actual story of and and plot of your book is a, is about the development and story of that book. Um, the, one of the most famous uh, books in that in that genre ever written is a book called and I recommend it highly At Swim Two Birds by the Irish writer Flann O'Brien, and it's about a story about a college student who's very bored and he starts writing a, a novel, and his novel is is the story of a writer whose um, whose characters of his book. Uh, rebel against him and want to live their own lives in peace instead of being subjected to uh, being slaves to his stories. And so they start um, um, poisoning him, basically, so that he's always sleeping. They start drugging him so that he's always in a coma sleeping so they're free to live their lives. And, and then they tell stories upon stories. Upon, and so it's just this constant evolution of story to story to story to story. And, and there's no common narrative besides the fact that this bored college student is kind of overseeing this chaos. Um, but it is a wild and, – and he's one of the most gifted lyricist uh, writers ever. But MG Nicole, MJ Nichols uh, would challenge him to the throne. Um, a postmodern belch is, is hilarious. It's it's a bunch of characters, and you have to know something, a little something about literature. You have to know what postmodernist writing is like. Um, but it is it, it's a group of characters fighting and warring with each other for control of the narrative of this book. So it's constantly going back and forth as they try to tell, change the story to what they want the story to be about. And they're fighting each other, and it's hilarious. Um, the other writer is Stephen Moles. Um, this guy's just – he was born on the dark side of the moon, obviously. Um, he wrote a book called – which was also published by Sagaminisus called the um, uh, the most wretched thing imaginable under the burnt umbrella. It's called the most wretched thing imaginable. And what he did was um, it's kind of a collage of different um, like the books, like the Book of the Dead, the the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and a lot of. Um, I guess, uh, religious books. He doesn't, I mean, he uses the Bible sometimes too. Um, a lot of like theological and historical books, but in most writing you have a story and, and the theme is the undercurrent that kind of holds the story together. Well, Stephen Knoll, Knowles in his book, The Most Wretched Thing Imaginable, flips that on its head so that the theme is the driving force and the story is the current underneath it that kind of holds it together. And it's um, very, it's funny, very funny. But again, you have to kind of know something about history and religion and uh, philosophy to kind of get his jokes and kind of what he's doing. But it is incredibly new, unique. There's nothing else like it. Uh, very, very funny. Um, he creates a whole language of uh, birds, 
um, and the idea being that birds, uh, their songs are actually like uh, the stories of these horrible happenings of the people that these tragedies that they see in in the people world, and they they it's they can't keep the torment inside, so they sing it out in the morning. And what we hear as beautiful song is actually their therapy sessions because they have to witness. Um, men and wives cheating on each other or car accidents, you know, horrific deaths, uh, scandal. They witness all this from their high position in the trees. And in the mornings they tweet it out so that they don't, they don't keep the ter the torment in. Um, it just goes on and on like that. It is incredibly well-written, um, very brilliantly imaginative, imaginative, I recommend both those writers, Stephen Moles and M.J. Nichols, uh, A Postmodern Belch and The Most Wretched Thing Imaginable. Read those two books if you read any other book uh, ever, besides the Bible. Read the Bible before anything else, um, or Martin Luther, or uh, Thomas Aquinas, or St. Augustine, or uh, Thomas Paine. Um, but if you're into fiction, M.J. Nichols and Stephen Moles. Okay. Um, that's our episode for this week. Um, the power of the written word. Um, uh, if there's any way any of you know how to uh, put pressure on this judge, <clears throat> excuse me, or whoever might have some sort of authority over the judge in the Roger Stone case to get this stupid, ridiculous, uh, anti-American, unconstitutional uh, gag order lifted, then... I'm all ears, so you can always write to me, roadnottaken04 at juno.com. If you have any books to recommend that, you know, I, I might like or, uh, or, uh, or what have you, or you just want to share, uh, you can always write to me too about that. I'm always looking for new books to read, uh, new authors to get into, and new styles to, to enjoy. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to Woke Nation on iTunes especially and leave a review on iTunes because that's how the podcast can reach more people on that platform. Um, subscribe on YouTube. I'm going to have another episode out on the Roger Stone thing tomorrow, actually going into more detail about it. Um, I'm going to do that tomorrow and hopefully have a video out on the Jussie Smollett case. So keep an eye out for that on YouTube. Uh, in the meantime, good night and God be with you.